welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. This is the only channel dedicated to that fictional genre known as steampunk, that wonderful combination of science fiction and history. Now because of the historical element, we often talk about our heritage, and as particularly that heritage that comes from Britain or the Victorian times. And as you can see by my attire, it is close to Christmas, so I'm going to talk about our English Christmas heritage, uh, particularly from the perspective of we Americans. So I'm going to start out by saying Merry Christmas. No, I don't say Happy Holidays. I don't think that that should be offensive to anybody who's not a Christian. In fact, I'm probably more of a Taoist than a Christian myself, but in any case, it's a part of our culture. So I think People, even non-Christians, ought to respect that. Now, of course, the Christmas celebrates the birth of Jesus way back 2,000 odd years ago. It wasn't really fixed on December 25th until 354 AD when the Pope decided that that's when it should be. Now, even though a lot of scholars say that, that really Jesus was probably born in the spring, we don't really know for sure. Now, for a long time, uh, Christmas was just one of many holidays in the church calendar. And it was not even, only the, not even the only holiday that ended with Mass. We had uh, other holidays like Candle Mass and Hallow Mass. Hallow Mass was obviously All Saints Day, which follows Halloween. And Candle Mass is kind of cool. It was the time they took the Christmas decorations down on February the 2nd which has something to do with the presentation of Jesus at the temple, uh, officially, so speaking. But I like how it's the same day as Groundhog's Day. Anyway, it was just one of, one of many holidays, and uh, at times it's been, been a, major, a major celebration, at times it hasn't been. In, in fact, at the time, at the beginning of the uh, 19th century, early 1800s, it really wasn't celebrated very widely in England and a lot of businesses didn't even close and so like Scrooge wasn't the only one who, who didn't close his shop on Christmas and you can cast a lot of the blame for that on a guy named Oliver Cromwell now for the, for those of you who are history challenged Oliver Cromwell was the Puritan dictator of England in the mid 1600s for about a decade or so and his son ruled for a little bit after it was part of this revolution they had against the king they executed the king and because he was a tyrant and then after Cromwell who proved to be a bit of a tyrant himself they restored the monarchy so one of the things that Cromwell as a Puritan did was he he really hated the celebration of Christmas and uh, he in fact banned Christmas caroling for example now this goes back to the Calvinist tradition, which my family actually comes from a Calvinist tradition too, uh, via French Huguenots, but the Calvinist, John Calvin, once said that he didn't like any holidays because that just confuses the faithful. Really the only thing you should celebrate is Sunday church service. Kind of a Grinch, I'd say. So anyways, the 1800s opened, the, the Christmas is not that big of a deal, and what changed was Queen Victoria, who was part German, and she brought a lot of the German love for Christmas to England. And another thing that changed was the Industrial Revolution. And although there was a lot of misery involved in the Industrial Revolution, there was, there was uh, pollution, there was long working hours, dangerous conditions, child labor, things like that, uh, but eventually Eventually, there was reforms, and it brought a lot of prosperity to the nation, which created a middle class. And that's what allowed people to have the leisure time to celebrate Christmas and buy gifts and so on. Now, previously, gift-giving was a thing for New Year's. But uh, as Christmas became more significant, people started giving gifts on Christmas instead. Now, by, the end of the, by the end of the 19th century, Christmas was probably the most major holiday on the British calendar. Now, of course, many of the elements of the holiday, the most religious ones in particular, such as midnight church services, nativity scenes, and Christmas plays are many centuries old. 
and some of the customs come from pagan pagan traditions, uh, such as kissing under the mistletoe and burning the Yule log. And they came into Christianity through the Roman Catholic Church. And I think it was a pretty smart thing that the Catholic Church did, was they assimilated these customs of the pagans rather than saying, oh, these are evil, you have to abandon your entire culture. No, they were smart. And they incorporated, incorporated in and, be, and created a Christian equivalent to these uh, ancient pagan festivals. And so, one of these things was the Christmas tree, which was big with German pagans, and uh, Queen Victoria brought that to England because she loved the Christmas tree. And when the public saw uh, Victoria and her husband Albert and their children celebrating around the Christmas tree, they said, we need to have a Christmas tree too. And of course, that spread to America. And now we have, uh, have uh, trees everywhere, and we still, my family still likes to have a real tree. <laughs> rather than the fake one. But whatever you celebrate, it is part of a, the German Christmas tradition. And now, one of the innovations that happened in the Victorian era was the Christmas card. And this was invented by Sir Henry Cole. And he introduced the idea of a Christmas card in 1843. And he commissioned an artist to design a festive scene for his seasonal greeting cards. And he had a thousand of them printed. Those Christmas cards they didn't use, he sold to the public and it became a huge hit. Everybody wanted Christmas cards of their own. And as the cost of printing was going down, it became affordable for normal people to uh, buy and send them. Now we mentioned the Christmas tree. Uh, we also mentioned Christmas caroling, which was banned by Oliver Cromwell. Now the Victorians brought that back, particularly into the early 1800s, there were two writers that made collections of old Christmas songs, thus uh, getting them, singing them again, getting people singing them again. Uh, William Sandys and Davies Gilbert, and they wrote Christmas carols, ancient and modern, and some ancient Christmas carols. Love those, love those titles. And many of the traditional songs, such as the First Noel, which was French, of course, with the name of Noel, uh, appeared at around that time. And Americans, we Americans, of course, took those traditions and we adapted them. We, we enhanced them. We made them truly excessive <laughs> at times. And one of the uh, most beloved elements of the American Christmas is Santa Claus. Now, the English know him as Father Christmas. We used the name that derives from St. Nicholas. He was the, like a patron, patron saint of children. I believe he was from what we now call Turkey. But the Dutch who founded New York, at the time that it was called New Amsterdam, called him Sinterklaus, <laughs> St. Nicholas. And uh, we Americans, being kind of language challenged, we corrupted that to Santa Claus. In 1812, Washington Irving, one of America's most beloved writers, he was a cool guy. I, I, I should talk a little bit more about him in one of my one of my uh, videos, but he wrote a, a book called The History of New York in which he talked about St. Nicholas soaring over the treetops in a flying wagon, which helped popularize it. Uh, there was also the poem A Visit from St. Nick, which we know more popularly as The Night Before Christmas. This helped shape our modern view of Santa Claus. It was published anonymously in 1823 and is usually attributed to Clement Clark Moore. Though some people, they have to be argumentative and say, no, it was actually Henry Livingston Jr., who were that guy was. <laughs> uh, Jingle Bells, one of our most popular secular Christmas carols. This was written by James Lord Pierpont in 1857. And, and I have to note that a lot of the popular secular Christmas carols were written by Jewish composers. <laughs> so we have to say that Christmas is far more than a Christian tradition. Santa Claus parades first appeared in Peoria, Illinois, but it wasn't a real parade. It was actually not on land. It was a parade of boats on the uh, Mississippi River. Now, that got adopted by Macy's Thanksgiving Parade in, uh, in, eighth, in, no, in 1924, which also featured St. Nick uh, on, on a float. 
and this helped establish Black Friday as the beginning of the Christmas shopping season. So thank you, Macy's, <laughs> for that insanity. Now, food is a major, major ingredient of the Christmas celebration. And one food traditionally associated with the holiday is fruitcake. I know a lot of people hate it. I've always liked it. It became popular back in the 1600s when sugar became widely available. I guess when the Caribbean got colonized. Uh, so you woke, woke people can like talk about the evils of colonization, I suppose. But anyway, that, that helped popularize fruitcake and all the other wonderful sugar treats that made us overweight as we are now. And the Victorians enhanced it by adding alcohol to the fruitcake, which helped make it more popular. Unfortunately, you don't see that in commercial fruitcakes now which maybe that's why it declined. Speaking of alcohol, <laughs> Christmas, at least in the pre-Cromwell times, was a 12-day drunken celebration. The well-known 12 Days of Christmas. Now that song was adapted from a Franco-English folk tune. I guess by Franco-English they probably mean the Normans, you know, the William the, Con the, William the Conqueror's people. <clears throat> and this was first published in 1780, although I'm sure it was a lot older than that. And the list of gifts was changing over time, and uh, it reached its current form with the Partridge and the Pear Tree in 1909. Of course, we've had a lot of parodies of that, including my favorite, Bob and Doug McKenzie, uh, where the ends with a beer. <laughs> and he had, they had like, like two turtlenecks, three French toast, and five golden toques, which is a stocking cap. Uh, and because Christmas was a 12-day celebration, it wasn't one big dinner. It was like a series of dinners. And I heard, this was kind of a cool thing I heard a few years ago on, a, on NPR, and they directed me to this website, which talked about an English food historian called Ivan Day. And he, he researches ancient cookbooks and the old cooking gadgets and, and utensils, and, and he replicates some of these. And, one of the things he found out that was turkey was not a big deal that it is today. It was any kind of meat, particularly roast beef, because most English people couldn't afford roast beef year-round, they, so they would have it for special occasions like Christmas. There were also, most of the main dishes on these 12 days were all meat-derived, and it was things like uh, swan and partridge <laughs> and duck, um, rabbit, and uh, even turtle. <laughs> they were like past the Christmas turtle. Now, <clears throat> even the even the Scottish got in the act, and they had a Christmas version of haggis that included raisins. Now, I'll eat just about anything, but that's one thing that I, that I uh, kind of draw the line at. Of course. Turkey was had been around for Christmas in England for a while since the 1600s, and it, uh, originally it was called Indian chicken. But the person who really popularized turkey as the centerpiece of Christmas dinner was Charles Dickens, and his famous, famous story, A Christmas Carol. It's something like a Christmas Carol in prose. It's got a really long title, which is very cool. Now, Mrs. Desperado and I just love that. Love that story. And a few years ago, around Christmas time, we decided we were going to watch every version of it we could find, whether online, whether on, on, on uh, DVD or whatever. <clears throat> we ended up watching 19 versions. And, and uh, we did three videos about our favorite, our least favorite uh, versions and about the best portrayals of the various characters like Scrooge and uh, Bob. Now, Bob, I'm going to say Bob Marley. No, Jacob Marley. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Cratchit and Tiny Tim and so forth. And even, you know, even the Muppets got into the act. So I'll put, a, I'll put a, a link to our videos from a few years back. I think a lot of you might have missed them and, and might enjoy looking into all these different versions. Now, A Christmas Carol was published by Dickens in 1843. And it's, it's, it's still relevant. It's, it's about redemption. It's about greed. It's about the true meaning of Christmas. You know, generosity, love, and all that stuff. And so it still resonates with us nowadays. But the reason he wrote it was because he needed the money. 
And he had a big family, at least by our standards, four kids and another on the way. And then I guess he had other family members living with him, so he really needed to get something that was, was a commercial hit. And although Christmas Carol was a hit, it didn't necessarily make him all that money because people were plagiarizing it. How horrible! Plagiarizing a Christmas Carol! And poor Dickens didn't. He had to sue somebody to get his money. And he had written three Christmas stories prior to this novella, the Christmas, which could mean it's a short, it's not really a full novel. So, and supposedly the movie was, or the movie, the story was inspired by a trip to uh, the Ragged School, which was a, an establishment that helped uh, protect, house and protect London street children. And I guess that made him think about Tiny Tim. Now, because of these because of the great significance of, of uh, Dickens' work in our culture, there was a movie made uh, in, in 2017 called The Man Who Invented Christmas. And this is based on the 2008 book of the same name by Les Standerford. It stars Dan Stevens, Christopher Plummer, and Jonathan Price. Uh, Mrs. Death Brown and I have this on our queue. We haven't watched it yet. So we're going to do that soon. But I guess it was critically acclaimed. And it talks about how the real life story of how he, he wrote, wrote the, the novella and incorporating a little bit of his fantasies of how the characters like the Christmas ghosts will visit him in, you know, in his mind and helped him come up with his uh, ideas, with all these wonderful ideas. And it's interesting. <clears throat> One thing I noted is that the uh, director of the film was Bharat Noluri, which sounds like a very... East Indian name. And so, again, I say, Christmas is not just for uh, white Christian Europeans. <laughs> it's for everybody. So, again, I say Merry Christmas. Uh, and I hope you really enjoy this holiday, and I hope you've enjoyed some of my uh, rather uh, eclectic collection of facts about how our Chris Christmas traditions got started and where they came from. Please leave your comments below, whether you liked it, whether you didn't. And uh, please like and subscribe, which helps us get out the good steampunk gospel. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying, Adios, amigos, and Feliz Navidad, amigos, from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.